Well, hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 8th of May and once again, yep, I am traveling again. So this week I am in St. George, Utah. It is the Ironman World Championship that I'm here just by luck because I'd already registered for St. George before it became the World Championship because Kona was pushed because of the coronavirus. So I'm here uh, as part of the World Championship there's my kind of name on the list of all the people. And there's some of the goodies you got with the beer and everything else. So by the time you watch this on Sunday, I'd have already hopefully finished. And the actual event is on Saturday. So after this, though, we'll be back to normal. I've got no more traveling planned. Uh, as always, I have the chapters down in the description. So you can jump to a particular update you really care about. And um, new videos. Obviously, because I've been traveling so much, I had the Texas Ironman two weeks ago and now this one, um, but I was able to, in the weekend in between, AZ900 has been updated for May with some new topics. So I released the first of four new videos to my AZ900 eight and a half hour course. It's free on YouTube. And to add some of those topics, I'll be adding, I think, three or four more videos next week to kind of finish off all of those new topics. So if you are looking at the AZ900, uh, I've got all the content you need to be successful. On to the updates for this week. So on the compute side, the static web apps now have the ability to deploy to a preview environment um, with those stable URLs. We did talk about this in a previous update. Remember, static web apps give us this fantastic ability to host pre-rendered content. Um, it could be generated by some tool. It might be I've manually created my HTML, style sheets, JavaScript, images, whatever that is. But it provides it over multiple points um, over all of the Azure infrastructure. So now when I have Azure DevOps, if I have something like a pull request, well, as part of that, that preview version can now be generated with a stable URL, making it easier for me to actually test. And it can also deploy things like backend APIs, the Azure Functions, everything for the complete end-to-end -end application. On the networking side, there were a number of web application firewall enhancements. Now remember, web application firewall is that layer seven native Azure security service that has many benefits for those HTTP-based workloads. And it really operates in one of two modes. There's a global balancing, a global WAF when it integrates with Azure Front Door, and then a regional WAF when it integrates with Azure App Gateway. So I can really think about that. That global WAF operates at the global network edge. The regional, well, that really attaches to the VNet-based App Gateway. Now, some of the updates we're seeing here is this new core rule set 3.2 gives me reduced false positives. It adds new protections, uh, Log4j, Spring Shell, CVEs, and more. There's improved performance, improved scale, two uh, megabyte body inspections, four gigabyte file uploads. It now has better API security because I can actually now work with XML and JSON content. There's advanced customizations with rule exclusions, uh, override default engine behaviors, native integration with WAF policies and App Gateway V2 instead of the legacy uh, WAF config things and better metrics, new security ports for the global WAF with front door, just a whole bunch of really nice updates. And then NAT Gateway, remember NAT Gateway is all about, hey, the outbound communication from something in my virtual network, it's a service I can deploy. It helps solve some of those port exhaustion problems we tend to see. With NAT, obviously we need a port for the various sessions operating based on the number of public IPs we have. NAT Gateway is super efficient with that. It can scale to prefixes to multiple public IPs. And one of the great things it also does is it gives us that control of the IP that will be seen by those internet resources. Well, now the health of NAT Gateway is being surfaced by our Azure Resource Health. So I can now think about, hey, things like dashboards. Uh, I could generate alerts based on those health events. I'm in a degraded state, for example. I can see historical views of the health. And then from there, I could also jump into maybe, hey, I need help. I need a technical support on that. On the storage side, so the blob object um, replication is now available for premium blob. And also there's a number of rule limits have been increased. 
if we think ordinarily about replication of a storage account, I could do GRS and it will replicate between the defined pair regions. I have no flexibility in where it's replicating to. So what I can actually do with the object level replication is at a container level, if we just kind of jump over here for a second. So if I just go and look at a storage account, now this could be a general purpose V2, or it can now be the premium blob account, both for the source and the target. If I go and look, actually now I have my option here, my object replication, and I can mix and match. The source could be premium, the target could be GPV2 or vice versa. But I create a replication rule. So I say, hey, um, my destination storage account, I just pick a storage account I want to replicate to. So I could really pick any kind of one I wanted over here. Let's pick that one. And then I pick the source container and then where I want it to go to. So the whole point here now is for each of the containers I have in my storage account, every container can be configured to replicate to a different storage account in different regions. So I could have one source storage account with 10 different containers, and each of those containers can replicate to 10 different storage accounts, if I wanted to, in 10 different regions. So I have a lot more granularity actually in that. And one of the things I can also add to this is I can add filters. I could say, well, hey, only add certain prefixes. So I have control over that as well. And as part of this change, I can also now do, instead of 10 rules, I can do a thousand rules. So I get this uh, a great big increase in the number of rules as well. Moving on, so miscellaneous, Event Grid now has user authorizations for partner topics. Now remember, Event Grid, is all about there's something generating an event. So I have an event source, and then via event grid, so those event sources talk to event grid, and then I have event handlers. Could be an Azure function, could be a logic app, could be something else. So the scenario here, there's actually multiple scenarios, but partner events are used by customers who can now subscribe to these generated events via event grid that originate from a partner, just like any other event source. So I could think about the partner, maybe they're providing a SaaS service. For a multi-step process, that partner can now create a partner topic in my resource group, in my subscription. I've given them authorization to do that and then publish events about some service they're hosting for me into that. Well, now it's in my event grid. I can now trigger things off of that. I can have event handlers. So now partners running some solution can generate events I can consume just so that they were coming from a native Azure service. So that's super useful. And the inverse could be used. I might use this same idea to publish events to someone providing a service for me. Moving on, access reviews now in preview. Uh, I can actually do an access review just for inactive users. So once again, if I was to jump over to this for a second, if I just go and look at my Azure Active Directory, and I go and look at my um, identity governance, and I go and look at access reviews, and I'll create a new access review. So if what I wanna review is teams and groups, so this applies to groups, so I'm gonna do a select group, and I'm just gonna pick any group I want. What I can now do as part of the configuration, you'll notice is over here, inactive users only on the tenant level. And what it's talking about is this is not gonna work for B2B direct connect users that aren't guests in my tenant. So it's just for like the regular um, users or guests that are objects or references in my Azure AD tenant. And I can now limit this access review to people that have not actually done something within a period of time I specify. So rather than having to review everyone, Hey, if they're active and doing things, they don't need to be included in this access review. But if they have not been active for this period of time, so 30 days by default, but I can change that, hey, then they would be included actually in this access review. So that makes it very, very useful in that scenario. Moving on. So Azure Virtual Desktop had a number of updates. I think there were four key updates around this. 
So we can think about, well, now I can manage these um, desktops through Intune, including Windows multi-session. So remember, multi-session lets me have a Windows client, which is normal single session, but in Azure Virtual Desktop, I can actually have multiple users and multiple sessions on that client operating system. It now gives me control over the scheduled agent updates so I can specify Windows quiet times when I want them to make those changes around the agents, the side-by-side -side stack, Geneva. RDP short path for public networks is in public preview. So the whole point of RDP short path is it's a direct connection between the remote desktop client and the backend session host, but it uses UDP instead of TCP, which is actually a better fit for this type of communication in terms of being able to go and actually see when there are problems, which TCP hides um, for the most part. It, it's more tolerant when there are problems. And so now we can start playing around with that. And we talked about this in a previous um, update. Remember the URLs are changing and it's just kind of reminding you of, hey, the old URLs and what it is moving to. So just a reminder about all of those various things. Finally, um, service bus, the minimum TLS version can now be configured. So by default, Service Bus will use the TLS 1.2, but it would also allow 1.0 and 1.1. What I could now configure is via a minimum TLS version parameter, an attribute of the resource. I can say, no, 1.2 is my minimum. Obviously, you have to configure well, who's talking to it, what do they support. But if I wanted to, I can now restrict that. And I can apply that when I'm creating a new one or an existing one. It's just setting that attribute. And that is it. As always, I hope this is useful. And until next video, take care.